It matters why we do this. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus broke bread. He gave it to his disciples. Take and eat. This is my body. He took a cup. Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant. It is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. It matters how we do this. Let each of us look at our lives. Let us recognize our sin. Let us see the grace of God in the body and blood of Christ, broken for us, poured out for our forgiveness. It matters that we do this. Let us eat the bread, drink from the cup, remember the Lord's death in our place on the cross, looking for his return. Amen. Wow, so that's what we're going to be doing together today. We want to welcome you here to the downtown campus at First Baptist McDonough. So glad that you chose to worship with us virt virtually today. And as you saw in the video, we're going to be discussing and we're going to be commemorating the Lord's Supper together. What we're going to need you to do is to make sure that you find some unleavened bread and that you find some juice or maybe you like that spoiled stuff, uh, the, the wine or the fruit of the vine. Um, I'm going to share a message about the Lord's Supper and then we will show a video that will take you and your family through a guided tour of the Lord's Supper together. So what you'll want to do is you'll want to have the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine ready, the juice or the wine. And then when you're prompted on the video, it will say uh, something to the effect at the very bottom, do this in remembrance of me. Well, that's when you'll partake of the unleavened bread. After that, if you'll just remain watching the video, uh, you'll come to the words that after supper he took the cup, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, do this in remembrance of me. And that's when you'll together as a family want to share in the fruit of the vine. So we hope that you have a really great experience today as we approach Palm Sunday, which recognizes the last eight days of Jesus' life that lead up to his crucifixion and ultimately his glorious resurrection from the dead, that we celebrate Easter Sunday. We hope that this provides you a really great experience as we move into the holiest of days. Thanks for being here. God bless. For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. You know, the scripture tells us right here that together today, whether you're uh, maybe in our worship services where we're hosting the Lord's Supper in person, or of course you watching this today, you're virtually going to join us in the Lord's Supper. But you and I together are preaching this message because we're all participating in the elements of Holy Communion. Paul goes on to say to the church in Corinth, though, listen to what he says. So then whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. So everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. You know, I know it would be something in your heart and mind that you would, would want to ask, and that is, well, what in the world is partaking of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner mean? And I don't want to be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord, so what does that mean? Well, we're going to talk about that and some other things today about Holy Communion. 
about the Lord's Supper. And what I want to do today is just give you some insight into what it is that we are doing at this very special occasion in the life of the church. Uh, today we gather at the Lord's table to spend time with God with a spirit of gratitude in our hearts in that he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross to save us. And that Jesus himself would go to the links and to the depths to sacrifice his own life to save us. Certainly that is worthy of a celebration or, or a commemoration. Certainly, certainly it is worthy that from time to time we set everything else aside to gather at the Lord's table to thank him for this amazing sacrifice. In fact, in Romans 5.8, Paul tells the Roman Christians, the Christians that were living in the capital city of Rome at the time, he said that God has demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. You see, when, when you, when I was at my worst, when you were at your worst, that's the point at which Jesus came to die for you. And in dying for you and for me, in the shedding of his blood, in his body being broken on that Roman torture device called a cross, we were set free from our sin. That all who would put their life, their faith, their trust in Jesus would never die, but have the hope of everlasting life. So today that is why we gather together for such an occasion. Uh, I thought we would spend some time looking at this concept of the Lord's Supper and what Paul meant by partaking of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. I think that would be time well spent. But a few important aspects about Holy Communion is that first, and, and we read about this in the Gospels, and we read about this in Paul's writings as he was instructing this new church as to what would become of the, the elements of worship and how the church would spend time together and what it is they would participate in when it came to a brand new church that has never even been dreamed before other than in the heart and mind of God. And Paul tells them, listen, when you're going to participate in the, the, holy, uh, the, the act of holy communion, that we must remember that this is a commemorative meal. It's not just a fellowship meal in which we gather it's just not that we take a bite of unleavened bread or we take a sip of the fruit of the vine. It's that we are taking time to remember, specifically dedicating this moment to remember God sending His Son, to remember the sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus said, remember me. As often as you choose to participate in Holy Communion, you remember me. And so we do that. You know, uh, usually in a Baptist church, we would commemorate the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion uh, four times a year, once a quarter. There's many other denominations that do so once a month, and there's even some uh, other Christian denominations that partake of Holy Communion every single Sunday. Jesus really never instructed us what was the right amount of time spent around the Lord's table in Holy Communion, uh, he never said do it every week, and he, he never said only do it once a year. He says as often as you would do this, leaving it up to respective churches and maybe even respective leaders of denominations. And so that's kind of what we do. And I would, I would tend to agree that maybe we participate in Holy Communion too few times a year. And then maybe those who participate in Holy Communion every single Sunday, 52 Sundays out of a year, that maybe that that lends itself towards Holy Communion becoming something of a ritual. Maybe that um, it loses some of its spotlight and some of its value in going through the act of, com of Holy Communion commemorating the Lord's Last Supper with His disciples every single Sunday. I think both critiques have merit. But it is a commemorative meal. And above all else, it is a time that we take to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made. 
But it's also a contemplative meal, and that's kind of where we get down to the crux of Paul's words when he said, don't do this in an unworthy manner. In fact, if we were to keep reading, Paul would suggest at least that there were some who had made such a mockery of Holy Communion that um, they might have even gone to an early grave. It certainly is implied. And so once again, we see the importance of, of a meal such as this. That it's not just a, yeah, give me a bite of this and let me have a sip of that. But it is a time when we take the unleavened bread to focus on the very fact that Christ's body was beaten and broken by the time he made it to the cross. And then at the cross, he was beaten again. And he was nailed to that piece of wood. And ultimately, to make sure he was dead, one of the Roman soldiers drove a spear into his side, piercing his heart. The scripture says blood and water mixed poured from the chest of Christ. When we think about the fruit of the vine, or I'm a good Baptist, so it's grape juice. When we think about partaking of Holy Communion and the broken body of Jesus, we also remember through the fruit of the vine, symbolically, we remember that this represents the blood that Jesus shed. You know, the scripture says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so when we partake of the broken body of Jesus symbolically through the unleavened bread, and when we consider that Jesus' blood was shed on Calvary's cross so that our sins could be forgiven, we remember that this is something commemorative and that you and I should examine ourselves. And what does that mean? Quite simply, it means that we ought to take inventory of our lives. Am I close to God right now or am I kind of far away from Him? Have I let some things come between God and me? Whether it's just life itself that is so busy. In is it something more deeper? Is it a sin that just can constantly plague you or dogs you? that you keep tripping up and falling into week after week that has kind of separated you from a sweet fellowship that you and I should have with God? What is it that might make your, your life and your soul, your essence, at odds with God? Well, Paul said, don't participate in Holy Communion in an unworthy manner. And how do we, how do we rectify that? How do we remedy the fact that maybe we are far from God. God's near to us, but we've kind of drifted away from Him. Well, it's quite simple. We're simply just asked to confess our faults to God, to agree with God that it is wrong. The psalmist said in Psalm 51, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. In other words, make my heart right again with you, God. I confess my sin to you, and what I did was wrong. But I want to come to this table to remember your sacrifice, and I don't want to do it in an unworthy manner. So God, forgive me once again. As I confess my faults to you, wipe the slate clean. And the scripture says, 1 John 1, 9, very simply, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe the very closest you and I will ever be to God is that moment before we partake of Holy Communion where we have confessed our faults to Him. And maybe that will be the impetus in your life, maybe the catalyst in your life to help you whether it's leaving your home in a virtual worship service or leaving a worship center in a, a live worship service, whatever it may be, to then go out and attempt to live right with God from this moment forward. Lots of revivals have taken place after moments like this where we gather around the Lord's table for Holy Communion. We don't want you to miss that, the incredible importance of that. It's not a time just to simply remember what Christ has done for us, but also for how we are doing spiritually with the one who gave his life to save us. It's a commemorative meal. It's a contemplative meal, right? So it's also a Christ-filled 
meal as well. You know, Jesus had gathered that evening in that upper room to sit down with his disciples and to share the Passover meal. And then at some point in the midst of that Passover meal, Jesus does something brand new, never done before, for the very first time. And what we discover as we read the New Testament in the early church, and as if you care to do, keep reading into church history, the writings that were left behind, for us to, to recognize what it is that the, the church that followed the early church continued to do after the first church had the people of the first church had all died, we discover that for 2,000 years, people have been gathering around the Lord's table to commemorate the death of Jesus through unleavened bread and through the fruit of the vine. That it is something that through and through is Christ-filled. I mean, if you think about it, Celebrating the Passover meal like the Jewish people did, and Jesus was Jewish, and his, many of his, most of his disciples were Jewish. I think they all were. And the, the, the 12 disciples, anyway. And, and so Jesus is having the Passover meal together. And it's, it's a pretty amazing story, way back from the Old Testament. There's, there's a saying in, in uh, seminary and, and in Bible study classes that uh, in the old concealed, in the new revealed. And so the Passover meal was only ever a symbolic representation of the fact that, yes, a, a lamb was sacrificed and the blood of the lamb was posted on the door frames and the door posts of that home, which if you cross reference, if you, if you connect the, the dots, it's eerily similar to a cross. When Jesus was dying on the cross, I believe it was John who said, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist said the very same thing when Jesus approached the Jordan and was about to be baptized by him. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so in the Old Testament, the Jewish people trying to be released from captivity from the Egyptians, they killed a spotless lamb. They took his blood and they posted it on the door frames and door posts of their home. And then the, the death angel passed over their homes, causing havoc and chaos among the Egyptians. The Jews were saved. The Jews were rescued from the power of the death angel. And so Jesus is here saying, hey, by the way, I'm giving you something brand new. The Passover meal was a representation of me coming to the world that as the Lamb of God, my body would be broken, my blood would be shed, that I would hang suspended above heaven and earth on a cross, marking the truth that between God and man is one mediator, that is Jesus. And so Jesus hungs, he, he, he's hung and he bleeds and he's broken and he dies on Calvary's cross to save us. And that is the truth of the Passover. And Jesus was simply saying, there's something more important than a Passover meal. And that is the last supper of the Lord, Holy Communion, a Christ-filled Meal, but it's a collective meal as well. Don't forget that. This is not something that I do at home or that you should do at home. We're gathering together, and maybe you are in your home because we're having a virtual worship service with you. But this is a collective meal. Jesus said this is something we do together. We take time together to remember the sacrifice of Jesus that he died to save us. Throughout the church age, Christ's followers have been gathering for 2,000 years to do this very thing. Just as we've been gathering on Sunday to celebrate on the day Jesus rose from the dead, to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, and on Easter, the grandest of all the Christian celebrations. To remember this momentous event in the life of Jesus is something we, together, we do together, not alone. Finally, what I want to say, though, and we'll wrap this up, is that it is a continual meal. Like I said, it is a meal that we share together. 
If the Lord tarries for another 2,000 years, the church, wherever the church is found, will be gathering to commemorate the Lord's death. Remember what Paul told the, uh, the Corinthian believers? Whenever you eat this bread, whenever you drink this cup, you are preaching the Lord Jesus until He comes again. And it's a reminder that we will share in this meal until Jesus comes again. And by faith we believe that He will. I have no doubt about it. And so, we gather. I hope that you will locate some unleavened bread in your home. Whatever version of the fruit of the vine that you would want to join in. And the next video we're going to show you now is a presentation that will cue you when you are to take a bite of the unleavened bread or to take that sip of the juice. You'll be given a moment, by the way, to pause and just confess your faults to God, whatever they may be. It's between you and God. To prepare your heart so that you will heed Paul's admonishment that we are not to do this in an unworthy manner, but this is serious. This is, a, this is an exciting time for the church, surely, but it's, it's, it's a serious time as well. When you hear the words, do this in remembrance of me, or rather, see the words on the screen, uh, that's when you will take a bite of the unleavened bread. And the next series, what you'll see is another slide speaking of about the cup. At the very bottom of the screen, I believe it says, this is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. I wanted to give you some insight into what's going to happen next because you together, alone or as a family, are going to share in the Lord's Supper together. We hope that you've enjoyed this experience. We hope that what's about to happen is meaningful to you in many, many different ways. A recognition a remembrance, a revival of sorts, preparing your heart for this special time. Thanks for being here today. We hope you'll be back next week. It's going to be exciting as we celebrate together. God bless.